Hey everyone, Yogo Marquez here, your friend in sales. Today I want to share with you the thought process that goes behind when you are developing your sales script, when you're talking to someone in order to close them. And this is the most important part when you are going about developing your sales script because if you don't have these in place, you won't understand why is it that a conversation is going sideways or it's actually going on a good path so that you can keep replicating those results every time that you keep encountering the same types of situations. So without any further ado, let's touch this. First to this, and you probably heard this regarding the Jordan Belford's method, and it works. There are some things, some adjustments that I, that I do that I find that I need them in order to get the process at flow. But for the majority of it, it's pretty much what, what he's telling you about. So this is how this works. You have someone that is in front of you and you, he, he is assessing essentially three things. It's the person, meaning you, the product, so the product must be a good fit for them and solve their, their problem, and the company that is standing behind the product, because if everything is in place and they hate the company, you start hearing some objections. And the first key to this is that it's first order consequences versus second and third order consequences. And what's happening to most people, usually people that don't have much experience selling to people, is that they think they can nail it like in the first order consequence. And it doesn't work like that. Because from toddlers, we were um, kind of programmed in a way that it's like to being suspicious and everyone is going to take advantage of us and all that crap. And it's not true sometimes. Sometimes it is. But in this specific case, what happened is that there's some sort of impediment in between you, that person, and like closing the sale. And because people want to be nice to you, like nice in and not being blunt saying that I hate you, I don't fucking trust you, instead of telling things like that, they say something like I need to think about it or call me in November next year, some, something like that. So this is pretty much the bulk of Jordan Belfer's presentation. But what I, what I found is that there's a couple more steps in between and this is critical. And it happens because all of us are different we see the world differently. So if you are a very detailed oriented person, it's understandable that if you are placed against the wall, let's say you are in a situation that's face to face, right? Someone is facing you and you, ha you are having to make a decision. You're going to use your skill set, the, the strengths that you have essentially. If you're like the, the bowman, you're gonna use the bow. Like if you're a karate guy, you're gonna use karate, like your strengths, right? So. If you are dealing with someone, let's say it's a psychotherapist, right? Their, their strength is that they're good with people, right? They're gonna deal with you differently. They're gonna use their strengths in order to deal with you. They have techniques, right? If you're dealing with, a, let's say, more like a kind of a aggressive type of person, like the muscular, muscular guy, like the gym dude, he's gonna get all muscle on you, right? It's understandable, it's, it's how people see the world. It's like they're going to, it's a fight or flight thing. They like defend themselves against, against the threat, right? So what I found is that how you have to see this, and this is how it works best for me, and this is how it worked wonderfully for me when I was selling door to door, and I was closing contracts like on a regular basis, like pretty much like taking orders essentially, and it was face to face. And I don't mean to this, like to say this to boast or anything, no, nothing like that at all just to tell you that I was getting better results because I had this method that I was following and it was working. Because every time that I encounter a specific situation, it's like, it's another one of those. And this is how you solve that specific one. This is how I did it. There's two parts to this. It's you, so you are um, presenting something, right? But you also need to see if that person is a good fit for you. And there are, there are a couple of things that you need to see from the other person if it's a good fit or not. The first one is that he or she must be the alpha. He must be the person that can make a decision on the spot. Because otherwise you're going to do everything right and th there will be like a um, kind of a governor on the engine, right? They won't make a decision because they will defer it to the alpha. It's like the husband or it's the wife or it's the boss. or so The person that makes the decision, right? So they have to be the person that makes the decision there. They are independent of anyone else but them. They are the ones that make the decision. They are the ones saying, let's do this, right? The first one, it may, must be the alpha. The second one is they must have a problem. And while the first one, you pretty much can't change it because 
they're either what the person that decides or not. And I've learned that if you close people that do not decide because they defer to you being the alpha because you are the one showing that you are the boss, right? What happens is when you leave and the husband comes home, he will, he will cancel the thing. It, it happens. So don't present things to people that are not the decision makers because otherwise you're going to get a monkey wrench on the whole thing. So they must be the alpha, first one. The second one is they must have a problem. And this one is fixable if they don't have problem because they might think they don't have a problem until you actually show them that they do have a problem unless they have your product. I'll give you an example. You ask questions, specific questions, something to the likes of, if you should die, does she have enough money to pay the bills? Something like that, right? Now you're presenting a problem. He has to, he has to answer it. And now in the back of his mind, he's thinking about this guy is right. She does not have enough money to buy all these employees and all this stuff. We need this, right? Now he has a problem. So until a couple of minutes ago, he didn't have a problem. Now he has a problem. And the way for you to get more effective at this is learning about what is it that you sell? What is it that your product is? And focus on that product. Forget about trying to be everything to everybody. That doesn't work. What you do have to be is everybody, uh, everybody's like best fit for that specific pro product because people perceive you as a figure of authority in that specific niche. And it's a great thing, not a good thing. Notice, it's a great thing. And it's a great thing because since you studied a lot about all angles regarding this product, you know specific questions that you can ask that instill pain, something like that, right? So when in the beginning, they probably don't have a problem. You start provoking problems and not like being like aggressive, but just asking open-ended questions. And remember that a key to being very effective in selling is asking open-ended open questions because they start, uh, they start talking more. And the more they talk, they will, they will eventually come to the conclusion that the sale is needed. They need to do the exchange from their money to the product that you have to, to deliver them. So that's the second one. The third one is financial wherewithal, and this is important. And like the second one, if they don't have enough money, if you do have systems in place that can allow them to afford a product, like a car, it's a good example, it solves the problem. So you can like uh, cut the thing in installments, something like, well, it's 30,000, but if you divide it by 12, it will be X and X and X amount. And if you come to think about it, how much you spend in tobacco, it's like, this pretty much like you, like paying one thousand, like say one bucket, one bucket a day, and you're spending four on coffee. So what, which one would you rather be? Like uh, have a heart attack or have a car? Something like that, right? I'm just uh, like goofing around a bit, but I just want you to realize that if you do have financial uh, systems in place, let's say like uh, finance, like with a, an agent, agency or something like that, or mortgage broker or something like that, like you can take advantage of that in a way that you can fit the product to their needs because they don't have to pay like 50,000 in like up front. They can pay in installments, something like that, right? So now, if you, do, are, if you are selling a product that no financing is available, you will have a problem there because you do have, you do need to be presenting that product to a person that doesn't matter if they are paying 100,000 in one, one, in one go, they, they, they don't even feel it. Otherwise, the, the, for the majority of cases, you, you do need to have some system in place in order to cut, cut the thing in like in more uh, installments in order for them to be able to afford a product. So they must be the alpha, they must have a problem or you cause them a problem until you, and you keep probing until you find that, okay, he's, he's like, he's holding on to this specific problem. So you now start exploring that out of that person. And then the third one is uh, financial wherewithal. So these are the three main ones that you are looking when you are evaluating your future prospect. From his side, now this is where the, the other part kicks in, which is they are looking at you first. They are looking to see if you are a reputable guy or girl, if you're like a figure of authority, if you know what you're talking about, if you look them in the eye, if you keep answering their questions in like in a clear way, the way that you speak, like the, the way that you present yourself, everything around you, like presents them, they, they get a vibe of, I like this person. He knows what he's talking about, he's very respectful, he's very articulate, he's like, he's being helpful, I like this person. They must have that. They must have that perception of you. 
The second one is the product that you're selling. If you are, if they like you, but they don't like the product, what's, what's the difference, right? So they just like you, the, the conversation will end there. Now, if you do have a good product, one thing that you do need to develop is a, a bulletproof case. And what I mean by this is, I'll give you an example when I was selling energy contracts door to door. I, start, I started to develop the script because I, I kept doing it so much. It's like, imagine you go to a building that has like 50 houses. It's like, if half of those people are at home, you make 25 presentations. So like at the end of the day, you pretty much have the thing nailed. So you have to like, you keep, it's kept a notch here, a notch there, keep improving the thing. Because you'll start hearing the common common things that people say, and you, as you st as soon as you start addressing these issues, so let's say some guy keeps asking, "What about this specific price?" Or something that doesn't matter. They're just coming up with a random thing. So, but you notice that people keep asking you about the same thing. So you incorporate that stuff in your pitch. So the next time that you're presenting things, you are already before he even says anything, you already address this specific concern. And you'll start becoming more effective and you'll notice that in people because they're saying he, he didn't even ask that and he already answered that. And he thinks he's like an authority. In reality, in reality, he just did it so many times and took time to understand people's concerns first. And now for the, the guy number 26, right, you're already addressing the specific issue in the presentation. So it's a good thing. And, and as you keep doing this, you will start developing this bulletproof case because they don't have any more questions that they can ask regarding that because you already did the presentation so many times and you already went through so many people's objections regarding the product. And as you started like um, incorporating these answers to these specific objections, the guy number 346 that you're doing the presentation, you like, you nailed it, right? Without even saying anything else. It looks like you're just doing it flawlessly, but in reality it's like, Iteration number 340 something. So this is what's, what's behind developing a bulletproof case. And you might be asking me, how do you do that? You start from the beginning. The beginning is gonna suck. And the second one is gonna suck less. And the, second, the, the same thing for the third one and the fourth one and the 50th one and 500th one and the thousandth one and so on. It's like you keep improving it. And you'll notice at, at uh, a point, it's like, they start asking you less questions and you'll see they start deferring it to you in a way to conclude the presentation. It's a bit different. One, it's like doing a presentation and they get like a bunch of questions. The other one is like, how can we solve, how can we implement this? It, they're, they're asking you in a different way. It's not like, oh, but this is different than this. It's not like kind of attacking your, your pitch or asking you things in a way that, well, the other guy presenting this, but then they didn't install it. So when you do the next presentation, say we're going to take care of the installing and all that. You see what I mean? So if you keep doing this, like after a while of improving the, the pitch, you'll notice that their questions start being more specific to their needs. Something like, when can they come? Something like that. Obviously life insurance is different, but just keep adjusting this. Keep an open mind regarding adjusting, regarding what is it that you're selling. So it's about developing a first uh, face value pitch and then being open-minded to the same type of questions that people keep a asking you and then incorporating possible answers to these questions and after a while when you start noticing that people are not asking these questions anymore they're asking this specific question then you keep coming up with a possible answer and when you see this starts working because you'll notice when it starts working when it's not working it's obvious so you keep adjusting but when you do that adjustment and see that it is working there you'll see them the the good um, the good proof to the pattern would be when they start deferring to you next steps in order for them to acquire the product this is what will start happening because essentially you're taking care of all the kind of rough edges edges around the thing and it, it looks flawless now this is a, what it means regarding a bulletproof case there's absolutely no way that they can keep probing the melon to see if there are some rotten places because everything looks pristine clean. That's it. And this is accomplished by you starting from a first pitch, then keep improving it based on the feedback that you are getting from the marketplace. And after a while, the proof to the button will come when they will start deferring to you so that you can make a decision when they can have the product.
right? The, the, the second part to this is, so we're talking about the person. We already talked about being the alpha, having the financial wherewithal and having that problem. This is when you're looking at them. When they are looking at you, it's the person, it's the product, we, like we talk, just talked about regarding the bulletproof case presentation. And then it's about the company. And a good example of this was when I was doing energy contracts that imagine you are going to a rough neighborhood, right? So just you being there, they already have some respect for you because that no, not even a mailman goes there. So I had a bunch of people telling me that not even a mailman comes here. What are you doing here? Something like that. So if you're going there, it's like, okay, props. It's the first one. What they are sometimes concerned about is that because, okay, Okay, so you have the first step, they, they like you. Okay, so what is that you're doing here? Then you move to the product, right? So it's like, okay, the pro they are now shifting their conversation between you and the product. And now they are focusing more on the product. Because they already developed some respect for you, they're now shifting towards the product. And now they are comparing in between what they have and what you are offering. And if you have a good product fit, because you will work at this so much, right? they see that makes no sense for them to be in a worse position and they keep probing to you a bit, but now they don't have any more questions to you because they start trusting you. And because you keep iterating regarding your knowledge on the product, you keep saying things regarding the product and comparing regarding the existing product, you, are, you keep developing your figure of authority because like initially they like you, right? You already show some guts, Go, just going there essentially. And now you're talking about a product. So you shift it from the person to the product. And now you have a bulletproof case. Now when they are comparing with what they have and what you are presenting now, and because you keep uh, talking about the product and presenting regarding what they have and showing them like it's a good fit, they, they have no more as, uh, questions to ask you because they already see you as a figure of authority. So now they're shifting to, towards the product. And because you have a bulletproof case, they have no more questions to ask regarding the product. So can you guess exactly where their questions might arise now? That's right, the company. And this is an important fa factor because if they, in the back of their minds, they're like, I like this guy, I like the product, I don't trust the company. You will start hearing some objections. And the reality is that if they're thinking something about, well, what is it if they if they go on they go bankrupt if I call someone and they don't answer the phone? What is it if they call this guy and he doesn't call me back? I will be stuck with this, right? So you start hearing some. I need to think about it, and this is how this works. Instead of people saying "get the fuck out of here," something like no one talks like that. Like, like very rarely you find it's not that it doesn't happen because it does, but it's very rarely that you're going to find someone that is talking like this. You will hear something like. Can you come over later or like, can you call me later or something? It's about invoking distance between you and the person. Like they want distance from that specific situation that you are presenting to them because they don't have certainty in regard to that specific section. So this is essentially it. It's you, the product and the company. So when you are presenting your whatever it is in my specific case now it's not energy contracts it's life insurance if you be if you are mindful of these three main sections that like i have to present myself in a way that i'm a figure of authority without being like very um like i'm the best so something like that like you just it's it's uh it comes with the fact when you are doing presentations it's like uh, inherently um incorporated while you're doing your presentation without even saying that. It's like when you hear someone talking and you clearly understand that they know what they're talking about. He's not telling you I'm a general, I'm an, I'm an expert. It just implied because you, you see him as a figure of authority. This is what I mean by implied. So it's you, it's the product. It must be like a best situation for them and in kind of in comparison with what they have presently. So they need to change. You're causing pain right? And now they have to change. So they pretty much got stuck with 
well as the company or not. And because you made a good point of uh, doing a good, great presentation regarding the company, I say it's MetLife, it has like almost 200 years, and there's like a, a part of the S&P 100. And so, so it's like, okay, this is a reputable company, right? So then, okay, let's do it, right? So this is the main parts to a presentation. And you need to incorporate this when you are doing your pitch, and we'll see this in a, in a future video. I just want you to be mindful of not getting like scattered all over the place regarding like more courses and more learning stuff and all that. It's pretty much comes to this. So it's like from the person's end. So when you are seeing that person, you must be the alpha. You must be, have the financial wherewithal or you having financing in place that will allow that person to buy. And the third one is they must have a problem or if they don't, because you studied the product so well, you must instill a problem because you know the product so well and you ask open-ended questions in order to start having them start asking you questions. And the second part to this is how that person sees you and how that person sees you is from three ends. It's you first, so you being a figure of authority. The second one is the product. It's like the bulletproof case logic behind the reasoning of why would they choose the product indetermined of what they have. And the third and final one is regarding the company that is behind you and the product essentially, because you are representing the company. And what I mean by first order consequences and second order consequences is that you must acknowledge and expect like a good professional does this, that you're not going to close them. Like the first time that you say something, you're going to ask, they're going to have questions. They're going to have concerns because remember, if they are analytical in nature, if they are detailed oriented, two different things essentially, but if they are detail oriented, they need to know details. So they're gonna ask you questions and you need to be prepared. And because people are not upfront, because people will lie to your face and instead of just asking directly, I don't understand this, like something like being super blunt, they say things like in a squeamish way. So it's like, I need to think about it. So what you do is when they ask you that, because you already know that these are the main pillars regarding doing the sale, you must, you must try to understand exactly where the problem is. If it's you, if it's a product, if it's a company, if they don't have the financial wherewithal, if they are not the alpha, and if they don't have a problem. So when you start understanding exactly where that is, you will find ways of doing that. And the way to do this is essentially when you're developing a sales script is first order consequences. So first, you know, the pillars, right? Then you have a kind of a presentation for first order consequences, right? And then you move on to the second page. This is why you now start becoming a professional because you're going to get objections. When you get an objection, when you're grouping and until you get to the second page, essentially, you need to know which chapter you will use in order to address that specific concern because you won't guess. It's impossible. It's like no one guesses. You need to know. So what you do is you ask open-ended questions in regards to the concern that that person might be, might have. And you pick up some words that they say and use them, use these words in order to extract further information so that you can choose the chapter effectively in order to tell that person exactly what they need to, to know. I'll give you an example. So let's say you do the presentation, right? You just completed the first order consequence uh, stage of your presentation. Now you're going to hear some, you're trying to get to get them to like to conclude the, the thing. So you want to get to the, to the end of the presentation and get them to sign on a spot. But then you're going to, you're going to hear some objections and you need to kind of expect this, right? So when you have an objection from that person, your first priority is to figure out exactly what their concern is. And the way for you to do this is picking up where they left off, not in a confrontational way, because you'll kill the report between you and them. And if they don't like you, if you come off too aggressive to them, they, they will retract and you close and you'll keep giving you more objections until they actually like you pretty much close the call and that's done. So that doesn't equate to money. So you need to solve this in a different way. And the way for you to do that is stay at the same level. If they are kind of aggressive, you are a bit aggressive and they are more calm. You're more calm as well. Kind of stay at the same level. And I'll give you an example. So let's say they, they defer back and tell, tell you something like, well, 
I, I won't like to have this, uh, do this alone. I need to speak with my spouse, right? Because you're talking about life insurance. In this, in this mind, is like we're talking about life insurance. I need to talk with my spouse because we don't, I don't make a decision all by myself. And you know essentially that this person is creating this sense between them and you because you understand, you already understood that he is the alpha. He's the CEO of the company in, on LinkedIn. He's saying that he's the owner, sole owner. It pretty much is showing that he's the alpha, but he's not making a decision. And he's doing that and he's saying this kind of objection to create space due to lack of certainty. And lack of certainty in one of these topics that I just mentioned. And if you're not sure which topic this one is, you need to extract this from that person. And the way for you to do that is not get aggravated, not get into a grunt, and extract the information from this person indirectly. This is the word I was missing. And what I mean by indirectly is that, let's say he says, I need to speak with my wife, okay? Now, he is lying because he does not need to speak with his wife. His wife doesn't know what we are talking about. He does, but because we are talking. So he's not telling you that he's uncertain about a certain specific topic. So what do you do? You say something like, always addressing the unavailable party, right? Being correct and very articulate and just say, just out of curiosity, what would your wife's concern would be? And then you wait. Now you put him on a spot because he now needs to keep the conversation going, being correct, because that's what we are, like we are brought up to be, like to be correct with people. And because his wife is not there, he needs to say something. And nine out of 10, what you will find is that most people, what they tell you is that is actually what is on the back of their minds. And they will, because this is what I mean by shut up. The power of silence here is very critical because he, he will actually tell you that. Something like, well, I actually talk with my coworkers. I don't understand how this works. How does an insurance company make money? And you still be mindful of this, be mindful of silence and let, let them like, com let them uh, complete what they're saying. Like wait a moment until they finish. Like keep, have them talking like, and then wait a minute. And then until you get silence, then you start answering, okay? So let's say he says something like, I don't understand how this works. Because uh, the insurance, notice how the, he's not saying, she doesn't understand how this works. He is saying, I don't understand how this works. So he, he was lying, he was caught on a lie. But he doesn't, doesn't care because he just, you place so, so much pressure, like psychological pressure for them to start talking, they will, they will start talking. You're not ad addressing this directly, you're addressing this indirectly. So they start saying, I don't understand how this works because I'm paying one one thousand bucks a year, and the insurance company is paying me one million. Now your concern is, am I being tricked? This is the main concern that he has. So you now address this and say, insurance business. This is how this works. They collect a lot of premiums from a large customer base, and they have statistics in regards to if there's some if there's uh, an issue with a policyholder, someone dies, or someone has a car accident, or something. So it's statistics. So if you will go about and insure just one car owner, that would be gambling. If you insure one million car owners, it's just statistics. And because that specific person, and this, this is why I mean by being mindful of the activity that that person develops. If that person, let's say works, it's a computer scientist, or it's like works in statistics, you will kind of relate to that because they know about uh, standard deviations, he knows about variance, he knows about chi-square tests. So it's like, it's their knowledge. They, they don't see you as a statistics dude, but they, they understand that, right? So then you get that objection out of the way. So when you do that, essentially when, they, when you address that specific concern of that person, then you say, do you think, when you address that specific case, then you loop back to your presentation and then keep developing more points regarding you, the company and the product. And you do another one, it's like a bonus. So let's say they ask something about a product, which is the statistics. Now you kind of, let's say you refer back to you and a little bit about the company. Like I said, just for a moment, let me reintroduce myself. My name is such and such, I'm an economist 
and I specialize in life insurance products. And the reason that I got in contact with you is that I specialize in, in tech companies. And the reason for it is that tech companies, because they have VC investment, and then you can keep, it's like a second order presentation that you have. So remember, it's like first order consequences, you have your first pitch, then you move to the second order consequences and you have a second order pitch. And you do that by in between, it's like addressing the loops and then navigating towards the one that was lacking more data. So that in their minds, when they are looking back at you saying the person, the product and the company, they like, you get to a higher stage. You started from a undergraduate and undergraduate, like now you're like a master's, right? And then you, if, even if it's like even more, you get to a PhD. So this is what I mean by keep developing the thing. And what start happening is that it's like opening a safe. And like you keep probing and probing and probing. And because you know that this safe has like three like spots, something like that, right? You already know it's you, the product and the company. You, need, you just need a little more, uh, more notch like regarding the product or the person, another notch regarding the product and another notch regarding the company. And because you keep piling these up, Eventually, like the, oh, the the safe will open. This is how this works. It sounds like weird, but this is how our, how our mind works. And in order for this to stay consistent until the end, before you even go through this process, you need you must understand first that they need to be the alpha. There must be financial wherewithal, and there must be a, a, um, a problem there so that they can use it in order to solve the specific problem. So in order for you to be effective, you need to first understand that you need first order consequences presentation. You don't go guns blazing and expect everything to end in the beginning, like front running, it doesn't work. So it's like have a, a first script entailing addressing all these aspects that I mentioned, like you, the product, the company, and understanding first if that person is the alpha, if has a problem there, and if has a financial wherewithal. And then you start hearing objections. It's understandable because you didn't address something very specifically. So you have to address that specific objection in a way that you are in the same level, at the same level, and address that situation indirectly. So if he, if he says, I need to speak with my wife, you don't say, I'm addressing you. It's like, that's confrontational. You don't say that, you say, what would your wife's concern would be? And when they tell you exactly what the problem is because you didn't address it properly, you move on your uh, presentation to second order consequences. So you have a second presentation set up in a way that you would develop yourself a little more regarding what is it that you do and how many years you're doing this profession and all that stuff. So that it's like uh, another level. It's like, besides my bachelor, actually I didn't refer, but I have a postdoctorate, uh, whatever. So, so it's like another notch, right? Same, same thing regarding the product. So yeah, exactly. And by the way, this product has this, 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 and that. So it's like other stuff that you didn't mention in the beginning. So that you are developing more, um, they are developing more a keen sense regarding exactly what you're telling them because you're not reiterating regarding what is it that you do, exactly what the product has. And by the way, it still has this, 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 and that, and you can benefit by this, 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 and that. Always addressing their specific needs. You don't need to go all Google on them just be specific, right? You, when you go on Google, you don't want to know all Google's information. You're just knowing about that specific uh, issue in detail. So you go to several web pages and find another one that has even more details regarding that specific one. This is what I mean by being detail oriented. And also regarding the company. So it's like even more stuff regarding the company. So the company has a good track record of paying people. When you need something from the underwriting department, you have the direct cell phone number from the doctor there. So something like really direct, right? So, and you keep doing this. Just being mindful that you pretty much need, it's, it's unlikely that you need more than two or three iterations regarding your presentation. It's very unlikely. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen because it does, but it's unlikely. If you've done a good job regarding uh, listening to people's feedback, so you kept improving the product pitch, you keep improving your elevator pitch when people ask you, what is it that you do? I'm John Marks and I'm a life insurance agent. Or I'm John Souza and I'm a computer science major. So it's like specific, right? And elevator pitch. And regarding the company saying, I work with X and X company because and, and all that. So pretty much life insurance companies are very well known, but I just uh, make a, a point of understanding that 
you need to be direct with people and when they are indirect with you, meaning when they are throwing objections, it's because they're not certain about a certain aspect. And you already know it's around these specific topics that I just mentioned. And this is how you go about and develop your sales script. So I hope you found this useful. Remember to subscribe and if you have any further questions or need any further assistance, let me know. I'll be more than happy to jump on board and help you guys out. Peace.